Have you noticed how important identity is today? Identity, whether it's a person or a business or a product, is very important in society. And people and businesses have actually been very ruthless in pushing who they are and what they have got to everyone else. I'll explain what I mean. When it comes to identity of a person today, using social media is very important. Facebook or Twitter or Instagram seem to be the thing that everyone is using to describe who they are. In today's society, everyone is expected to have a Facebook or a Twitter account, and the idea seems that in order to be anyone, you need to update your account several times a day in order to tell the world what you have been up to. Now, just having a Facebook or a Twitter account isn't enough. Keeping up with what other people are doing isn't enough. I tend to do that, but I'm reliably told that's not the proper use of Facebook or Twitter. If you want to be popular and ensure people remain interested in you as a person, you need to keep people up to date with what you have been doing. Incidentally, according to friends of Helen and I, we don't really have a Facebook or a Twitter account because we don't do things properly. Going through the news feeds on Facebook or reading people's tweets on Twitter and just liking posts or, or retweeting what people have been saying is considered wrong and is antisocial. Well, if that's true, I like being antisocial. Anyway, I digress. The point is that having a Facebook account or a Twitter account gives you an identity that other people can relate to. The same is true of businesses who are trying to sell themselves and sell their products. Having a logo that is easily recon recognisable, along with a product that everyone wants, means that economically and socially you will be popular. So businesses can be very ruthless with their advertising and their competition that they have with other people about how important they are by comparison to everyone else. Apple, for example, are very ruthless in how they have advertised the iPhone and the iPad computers and have even taken other companies to court in order to push their product over and against other people's. And I am reliably informed that, that Apple are now encouraging people who use their products to form groups or form clubs that encourage friendship around their use of Apple products. And anyone who doesn't use that particular product is ostracised, is kept outside of that group and the identity that they are pushing. Added to this, if you look at advertising at the moment, the phone that you have is an extension of your digital self. And it is very important that the phone that you use gives your digital identity the right one. But identity isn't about Facebook and social media and digital products, although they are things that people use. There are other things that are equally about giving identity. They can be things like from the clothes you wear, to the places you go on holiday, to the car that you drive, to the people that you associate with, or even the job that you have. Have you noticed that whenever introductions are made at social gatherings, one of the first questions that people will ask each other as they introduce themselves is what they do for a living, what their working age is, are they retired, how are they contributing to their community? And the identity that they then tell in that narrative is so important. Identity is so important in the working world because it speaks of the contribution that we make to society. All of these things make us who we are. And although we might be shying away from thinking about our identity in this way, the society we live in is forcing us to think about it. 
But what has all this got to do with our reading from Mark's Gospel this morning? Where is the identity that is displayed here? Well, the two readings that we've heard are everything to do with Jesus' identity, and they display his identity in striking ways. First, that he has the power to forgive sins, and secondly, that he has the control over nature. So we're going to look at the two readings that we've heard and see how they tell us something about Jesus' identity. The reading from Mark chapter 2 is the first physical healing miracle that Jesus performs. In Mark 1, we hear talk of Jesus driving out evil spirits and curing illness, but here is the first time that we hear a story of Jesus performing a miracle for someone whom we can assume has been paralysed from birth. And that is significant because suddenly Jesus' power over physical ailments is taken to a whole new level. No longer is he just claiming to have power over illnesses people contract over their lifetimes. But he is able to speak directly to someone's condition that they have and they've been living with for the whole of their lives. And that sets him apart from other spiritual healers. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the story. Jesus is in Capernaum, and according to Mark's Gospel, has been spending time at home. People have heard about the amazing things that he has been up to, and so they come and they gather in his house to listen to what he's teaching, and possibly they're expecting a miracle to take place. The atmosphere is electric. Everyone is on tenderhooks. People are hanging on every word that Jesus says. They're hanging on every action he performs. And because people are so expectant and so excited that the place fills up until there is no more room. And into the midst of this gathering come men carrying between them a paralysed man. We're not sure about the relationship that they have with this paralysed man, whether it goes more than just simply mere acquaintance. But there's clearly love between them and the man, enough to do anything for him. So maybe they're actually family members And that possibly means that they've all been struggling to cope with this condition that this man has had from his birth. And when they get to the house where Jesus is in Capernaum, they realise that there's no more space left for them to bring their paralysed friend or their paralysed brother to Jesus. And so they go out of their way to get Jesus' attention. They make an opening in the roof of the house and then they lower the man down to Jesus' feet. And what happens? Jesus doesn't immediately heal this man. Instead, he says a very surprising thing. He says, your sins are forgiven. Why? Why does he use those words rather than simply saying, get up and walk? You are healed, my friend. Well, the reason is because Physical illness in first century society was connected with, with people believing that this person, if they had a physical ailment, was being punished by God. Punishment for a sin that you had personally committed yourself or a sin that a member of your family had committed in the past. And it stood as a visible sign and as a warning to the rest of the community of the consequences of sinning against God. Contact with such a person drew the risk of being out of favour with God yourself. And usually, people would steer clear of such people who had contracted a physical ailment caused by their sin. And it was as if a family member... You would, you would reject them. If it was a family member, you would reject them. 
Jesus recognises all of that angst and all of that worry that the men have in bringing the paralysed man to him. So instead of simply saying, get up and walk, be healed, my friend, he deals with the spiritual as well as the physical dimension of the family's needs. He recognises that the family of this man haven't abandoned him and at personal risk to themselves have brought their brother to Jesus and they see in Jesus their last hope. And Jesus rewards their compassion. He rewards their love and their care, not only with the reward of healing, of physical healing, but also removing the guilt and the fear of sin that they have all carried together for the whole of the paralysed man's life. Jesus, in this moment, restores them as a family to each other and to God. And although he draws the wrath of the religious leaders who, pre who are present and who claim, how can this man forgive sins? Only God can do that. Jesus is claiming the identity of God's son for himself. What is so beautiful about this passage is that through the healing that takes place, Jesus is claiming to be the author of creation. He claims the identity of God himself and addresses the deepest desire that this man and his family have. To be at one with God again. As you read this passage, you can't help but make the connection with Psalm 139, where the writer praises God that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that God has created their inmost being, woven together in their mother's womb. Jesus addresses the inmost being in this healing miracle and enables the man and his family to praise God and experience restoration into his presence. So we see in this passage Jesus' claim of identity as God's son and his power of overcoming sin and exclusion from God's presence. The second reading we heard this morning from Mark's Gospel is another identity claim that Jesus makes, and that is his power over nature. The story of the calming of the storm is again familiar to us, and we know from the narrative that the disciples recognise in Jesus their hope for survival. The Sea of Galilee is susceptible to sudden and violent storms. And it is clear from the way in which Jesus interacts with his disciples when he first calls them that they are experienced fishermen. As such, they would have been more than prepared for the sudden and violent storms that occurred on the sea. But there is something different about this storm. There is something more violent and more powerful about it that leaves them feeling helpless. And so they cry out for, to Jesus for support. This is strange because nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus ever claim to have any experience of being a fisherman. In fact, our understanding of Jesus is that his trade was that of his father, that of a carpenter. So how would Jesus succeed where experienced people had failed. And the reason is because the disciples recognise an otherness to Jesus' identity that goes beyond being a teacher or even being a healer of disease. They see in him the power of God at work. And so they come to him because they want God to save them. And God doesn't disappoint. Jesus commands the waves to be still and the wind to be silent and the narrative tells us that that's instantly what happened. Jesus says to the wind and the waves, be still, be calm and immediately it occurs. The waves become a dead calm as, as still as a mill pond and the wind completely dies down. In this moment, Jesus' identity is clear. 
He is from God. He is the same as God. For even the wind and the waves obey him. Again, there are beautiful parallels with the Old Testament. And this story reminds me of Isaiah 43, where God says to his people, Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Jesus, in this moment where he calms the storm, is claiming the identity of God himself. He has come to lead his people to the new creation. And that through him, hope is about to be restored. So what does this tell us about who Jesus is? Well, it's clear that Mark wants us to recognise that Jesus is the one who was promised by God, who would transform the world to the desire and design of God's heart. But these two examples take us further. They take us further to enable us to recognise that Jesus is not just the one sent from God, but is God himself. Jesus has the power to forgive sins, to control nature, and to restore people and communities to God's loving presence. And the joy of this message overwhelms us. In both encounters, the people who witness these things are left with an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder about who is this man, that he can do such things. And that sense of awe and wonder leads them to wanting to learn more about him. When we read these stories for ourselves, we too are left with an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder. And our desire should be to want to know more too. In Jesus, we recognise that God is active and at work in our world. And our deepest desire should be to want to respond and learn more. And as we will see in the next sermon in this series... The overwhelming impression that the disciples are left with of God's power is that God is alive and active in Jesus, but it swiftly turns to Jesus claiming to be the suffering Messiah. But for the moment, we'll remain with the awe and the wonder and ask ourselves, like the disciples, who is this man that has the power to overcome physical spiritual and even natural elements. Amen.